Hey folks, do you know what comedy, friendship, and sobriety all have in common? They're all things that we talk about on our podcasts over at Duck Duck Grey Duke. We've got Duck Duck Grey Duke, the not-so-anonymous alcoholic, and we've got Dude Absolutely. Comedians, mental health experts, addicts in recovery, and addicts in active addiction. Head on over to Duck Duck Grey Duke, wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as YouTube and iHeartMedia. Thank you. What's your comedy like? That's what's coming up on the Art of Bombing, episode 138. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast, and nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing. So Dan went out and bought a tape deck, who knows why he bought a tape deck. Now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s. So hey there all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work, tell him all about your worst times, it's The Art of Bombing. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Art of Bombing. I'm Dan Bublitz Jr. It is Friday, June 5th, 2020. I hope you're doing okay out there. I don't expect anybody to be doing well or doing fine or fantastic because a lot's going on in the world today. Uh, A lot of things are happening and have happened and uh, it's been rough for a lot of people but uh, in the long run it's good it needs to happen Uh, we need to be uncomfortable for a little bit because the Black Lives Matter movement is important and it should be important to everybody and a lot of people say all lives matter well not until Black Lives Matters. You can't put the cart before the horse. One has to happen before the other. Keep that in mind when you try to argue that phrase. Now, if you want to get involved and you can't, maybe you live in an area where you, you just can't get involved or you can't help, there are other ways. You know, you can donate some money. If you, you, know, there's the, you can donate to the Black Lives Matter movement. You can donate to the Minnesota Freedom Fund. They help uh, bail out protesters that get arrested. Then, of course, you've got the National Bailout Fund. You can donate to that. I've been personally helping with a new organization in the Twin Cities called Shea Cares. It is a, it's a little community organization that was started by a Twin Cities comedian, Shea Webby. And uh, a lot of comedians in the Twin Cities have been involved in this organization, and it's great. Uh, she started a uh, pop-up food bank to help people that were affected in neighborhoods that were uh, where the some of the rioting and looting took place and so now the stores are closed and they don't necessarily have access to go shopping they don't uh, because a lot of the public transportation is shut down right now and they're doing a good thing so i've been donating some money their way i've been trying to volunteer when i can and help them with supplies and different things and you can too if you want to get involved with that organization just look up shea cares on facebook you can look for shea cares on twitter uh, and you can look for Shea Cares official on Instagram. There, if you want, if you live in the Twin Cities, volunteer. They're always looking for help right now. I'm not sure how long they'll be doing the food bank, but I do know that they're they're out there today, right now, on the, in St. Paul at Lexington and Central. Uh, go check it out and donate. See what they need and and make a supply run if you're in the Twin Cities. And if you're not. You can donate a little bit of cash that helps them get supplies when they need it. Uh, anyway, so that's how you can get involved. This isn't about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get into the episode here pretty quick. Uh, I don't have a lot to do other than that. I will say tomorrow, or to not tomorrow, uh, <laughs> I'm recording today, and tomorrow is when this comes out. Uh, well, there you go. You know the secret, which you probably already knew. But uh, Friday, June 5th, if you're listening to this on the day that it came up, I will be doing a guest spot at a drive-in comedy show at Boss's Comedy Club in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, several comedians will be on that. It's, I believe it's a little showcase, and it's going to be in the back parking lot of Boss's Pizza and Chicken. The, that's where the Boss's Comedy Club is located. Uh, so it'll be a fun little event. You can come in, sit in your car, uh, turn on your FM tuner, and you can listen to comedy from the comfort of your car i guess and you can even order some food so check that out if you're in sioux falls all right today on the show my guest is zach peterson i did not even mention that at the beginning because i was you know there's other important matters to mention uh but my guest today is zach peterson he's a fantastic comedian based out of uh, omaha nebraska i believe he's lived in chicago and he's lived in los angeles and we had a great conversation about everything that's going on as far as corona goes this was uh our conversation was pre uh, pre the uh, 
uh, the George Floyd death and all the the police brutality that is coming to the surface and all that. So we didn't really talk much, uh, didn't talk about that at all. But we did talk about coronavirus and how that's affecting things. So, all right, that is enough of this babble. Uh, Check out the podcast website, artofbombingpod.com. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, like, leave a rating and review. Say some nice words. I'd like to hear what you think of the podcast. I'd like to know if you think we're doing a good thing or, or maybe not. I don't know. I could use some constructive feedback. It's all cool. All right. So that's enough of my babble. Let's get into this episode. Here is my conversation with Zach. Enjoy. I put up tile in the bathroom and I'm waiting for some other stuff to come in and I'm going to finish. I'm putting up uh, some backsplash on the ceiling. We're going to paint it. We're putting in a new cabinet. And I'm all pumped about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, like, I- I'm on the road so much, I have someone else mow my lawn when I'm gone. Mm-hmm. So so uh, I just got a lawnmower. I put it together today, and I'm so fucking <laughs> excited to use it. Uh, You're like, yeah. yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Are you guys, uh, you're down in Omaha, right? Yeah. All right, I I guess I'm I'm not up to speed with how Nebraska is handling things. Are you guys in like shelter in place and no anything like no? Okay, there's nothing. There's everything, no rules. Oh, everything's just open. Oh, so it's a lot like South Dakota then, essentially. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the it's a, Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota is just like ah, do whatever. We don't care. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, look, we uh like the mall is open here like, oh jesus yeah like i drove by it's like it's a fucking mall open it's like yeah people are at it yeah so. yeah i've had to go make a couple trips to uh, menards uh, you know mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm only going out when i absolutely have to because i'm not i'm not a fan i'm not even a fan of going out anyway <laughs> yeah yeah totally <laughs> anyway <laughs> dealing with people yeah. on the regular so i try not to go out when i when i don't have to but every time i go to menards i'm like why are there so many people here <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and we're yeah. in a shelter in place <laughs> <laughs> or you're in minnesota right Mm-hmm. okay yeah yeah we're well now we're in a shelter in place until may 18th and then they're they're loosening it up a little bit. They're mm-hmm. they're now we can do gatherings of ten to start, and you know yeah. small social distancing things, and slowly trying to see what happens and kind of work into opening things back up. You know, mm-hmm. with the with the the thought that if things go crazy, don't be surprised if we go back into shelter in place. But you know, sure, which sure. which hey, that's better than just being all crazy. I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, it's. I guess the whole the whole philosophy behind it is ignore it. Maybe it'll go away. It's like it will. It'll just take a couple of years, I guess. But yeah, yeah, you know, and we obviously can't do that. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't make it me does like. Does. I mean, I go to the grocery store, and that's about it. Uh, I don't like. I mean, my my income was teaching stand up, performing stand up, and uh, you know, selling things at an antique mall. You know, like. Cause I, I go to thrift stores on the road and I'd find, you know, stuff like, Oh, that's, that's good. I can do, you know, make some money on that. You know, just, it's just giving me something to do. And like, you know, not a whole heck of a lot of money, just enough to oh yeah for sure uh, justify, you know, just the health because, you know, it's all about having those little, like little graphs of things like, ah, $400 there, $200 there, three, yep. like, and just getting you know, stringing things together. So it's just another yep. like sort of stream. So, but all those things are just gone now. Oh my god, I can't imagine. That's ooh, rough. Yeah. Have you did any? Have you tried to do any of your your comedy classes online, like doing no. a Zoom class or anything like that? I, I, I haven't yet. But yeah. that's a good idea. I should I should look into that. Should, yeah, you should look into that. I mean, if you mm. were having, you know, if people are already coming to classes and stuff like that, there's a pretty good chance you could you probably won't make a ton of money, but it'd be something better than nothing, right? That's yeah. exactly right. Better than nothing, and uh, <laughs> something to do. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. Have you done any of those Zoom? Have you done any shows like Zoom shows or anything? <clears throat> I have done a few. I've actually produced a couple myself too. Like, mm-hmm. and uh, I've did I did some that weren't great. And I did some that were all right. I mean, 
like I said, it it'll never replace stand up com live stand up comedy. But I mean, totally. it, it's it's a substitute for now. I mean, the cool thing that I've seen with it is that uh, you get to meet other comics and work with other comics from across the country that you yeah. might not you might not meet otherwise. You know, totally. so that's cool because there's there's networking going on there, giving you know mm-hmm. opportunity to kind of meet. So when things do kind of start opening up when you're in their area, maybe that'll be a contact you can use. You know. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And like if the Zoom shows are ran good, it's they're mm-hmm. kind of fun. It's good to get that laughter. Like you can hear the laughter, if you know. Totally. So I now I've did stream shows where it's just like going to Facebook Live or whatever. And there's no no laughter. And those are really awkward. <laughs> yeah, it's like I've done a couple of them. And the, and the, the most like unique experience is when like you are telling jokes and there is laughter, but it's not set for whoever makes noise is the mm-hmm. main image so like you're, you're telling your jokes and then your your fucking screen's just flashing like like different like you know people yep. emoting like ha ah, like, ah, like what the f-? it's 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 odd it's it's different it's very it's, odd it's it's great to have the laugh i mean i i love like i would rather do a zoom show than no shows uh obviously we're we're, we're working with what we have you know yeah and like yep. i did i did trying to adapt yeah, exactly. I did arguments and grievances uh, uh, online through Zoom, and that was so much fun. Uh, but yeah, it's it's different. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Definitely different. And, then, and and then you have the delay too. I mean, there's that too, where mm-hmm. you know, I had that. I did a Zoom show the other day, and I did a joke, and. I was like, well, that joke bombed. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting ready to go into the next joke. And then everybody started laughing. I was like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> fucking delay. <laughs> I got to remember I'm, that delay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm working on a, on a new joke. Well, like, you know, before we went into quarantine, I was working on a new joke. And it, it, it's very fresh. Probably done it like three or four times before uh, getting into getting into quarantine. Uh, so I'm still unsure about it. I don't know exactly, like, it's worked very well a couple times. It just sort of, you know, died on the vine once or twice. So I'm like, okay, is this a good joke? Like, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, right? Yeah, I still it's know definitely what- hard to figure mm-hmm. that stuff out now. <laughs> and then one of the one of the shows I did, it's it's a new, like, it has a callback in it. So it's like sort of a closer sort of situation. I have to do it after this other joke. Uh, and then, like, I was doing it on a, a, a Facebook Live, Instagram Live show, and my audio cut out in the middle of that joke. I'm like, "Oh fuck! It, oh. I am this joke sucks completely, and I gotta keep going with it." Uh, and then, like at the end, I just noticed they're like, you know, like I could tell that they were, they they had no idea what I was saying. I was like, "Oh, good. It's just it's a malfunction. It's not my terrible joke. It was a technical issue and not me." Yeah. <laughs> Like uh, I wish I could I could do that I could blame that on like real shows where it sucks you know like, yeah oh. you're like oh, the mic went out didn't you couldn't, yeah. you didn't hear me <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> oh man that'd be great I will one thing I've learned since doing some of these virtual shows is I'm a lot more animated than I thought I was on stage like I always felt like I was just uh, I stand there with the microphone you know and not mm-hmm. really move a lot. But now that I've been doing, I'm like doing jokes and I'm like, wait a minute, when I do this joke, I actually do a physical action and doing it on this, like they can't see me doing this, you know, (laughs) I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) I just imagine the other people in my house because I live with my girlfriend and I have a friend that also lives with us. uh, And like, you know, my jokes are very stupid. Uh, Like I have a joke about gravy. And like, I'm just imagining like people passing by the room I'm doing it in, and I'm just yelling about gravy. I'm like, fuck, man, I must be a nightmare to live with. <laughs> yeah, uh, fortunately, I have my own little area upstairs where I'm. I, when I do stuff, I can just go up there, so I'm not bothering my fiance too bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even one show, I even come, I was like, you know, that sounds a lot different yelling in my room alone. <laughs> <laughs> than to a crowd of people. I feel like a fucking psychopath. <laughs> well, we kind of all are, I feel like. <laughs> mm-hmm. We're all we're all Jones and for for the 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 affirmation oh. affirmation and laughter and <laughs> everything. Yeah. <else. laughs> well, when we when we started going on shelter in place, like you remember the night that the NBA was canceled, 
uh, like all all flights in from Europe were canceled and everything. That was March 12th, and that was the second to last day of tour that I was on. Because mm-hmm. I did a whole Midwestern tour with Ian Abramson, and we started, I think it was February 21st or February 22nd. And then uh, Springfield, Missouri, we're at a show. We're at the show in a, in a used bookstore, like one of those anarchist bookstores, you know, like mm-hmm. the cool bookstores called Bookmarks. Yeah. And it's like, you don't, yeah. And, and uh, I was like, oh, you know, like, it's like, oh, fuck, this is actually really serious. And then we get back the next day and we do our show in Lincoln. Uh, and uh, that was the last show. The Omaha show got canceled. And then I, I've been like, I've been in at home since save, you know, going to the store. Uh, but it's, it's such a weird, like change from being on the road consistently for almost a month. That's like, I'm not even leaving my house. Yeah. Like, like I, I couldn't wait to get home. <laughs> that tour, you know, because yeah. like on the road after 10 days, it's like, fuck, I need to go home. I need to sleep in my bed. But now I'm just like, I will go anywhere. I will go yeah. to the, I will go to the small town shows that I, that, that hate me. Uh, <laughs> please, just one night. And the, anywhere that I can get on a stage in front of people, I'm there. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. Oh. So your last show then would have been March 13th. Mm-hmm. Yep. Same here, actually. Yeah. Yep. Same here, actually. My last show was the 13th. Yep. I had a bunch of, uh, was in Garrettson, South Dakota. It's a, a a dinner show thing that I run. And we were, we're like right on the verge of, you know, even the day of, we were like going back and forth on whether or not to do it. And the owner of the venue was like, well, we already sold some tickets. Nobody's calling to cancel. So let's go ahead and do it, you know, because it might be the last time we can do anything like this. And I was like, all right, cool. And so we did it. And then and then after that, everything else I had booked and I had a lot of shit booked, just all it slowly started getting canceled and taken away. And I was just like, oh, yeah, dude, I had 10 days in Denver booked at the beginning of this month, 10 days. And then. At the very end, the, la- the last few days, my girlfriend was going to come into town and we were going to go see the Mountain Goats together. And they're my favorite band of all time. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, oh, man, I'm so excited. This is like nothing. And also, I was supposed to go to Europe with my dad. Uh, oh, jeez. Like in March. So like all these things gone. It's like, well, yeah. listen, oh. one, one positive thing is the first time I ever got a full refund from the airline. So, oh, wow. Hey, well, there, I guess that's, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I will say a little pandemic, <laughs> right? I was actually glad that uh, so I had a, I had a dry bar scheduled to film in April, which got canceled as well. But I had not purchased my plane ticket yet, mm-hmm. and I was like about to, and then it got canceled. And I was like, God, I'm glad I waited. I'm glad I was a procrastinator right. here because then now right. I didn't I didn't have to deal with trying to get a refund. <laughs> Dude, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was I I did one of these with a friend of mine from uh, San Diego, and we were actually supposed to be having lunch in person because I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be doing shows out in California and Nevada and Arizona this week, and so I was just yeah. like, oh, <laughs> it sucks. I mean, like, yeah. it. I'm like a shark. I'm like I only I I'll die if I stop moving. I gotta travel. <laughs> I gotta. Let's... Yep. I feel that. Yeah. 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 It's funny too, because I was thinking about this uh, earlier in the year. You know, I felt like I was really starting to like pick up with a lot more gigs. And I felt like, okay, this might be the year where I'll be able to transition into going into Mm. comedy full time. And Mm. um, I'm done, just about done with school. So I don't have that stress anymore. And, you know, I'm only working part time anyway. I'm getting more and more gigs. I'm going to have a dry bar coming out. Like, this is the year. And then, yeah, yeah. (laughs) complete stop dude, like well yeah so much for that plan <laughs> dude it's yeah every every single person is this yeah it sucks i mean there's nothing we yep. can do about it just- nope that's exactly and that's how i i you know i'm well aware of that it's like mm-hmm. you know you can think all day about it and 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 stress on it and think oh man why is the universe punishing me and it's like well it's not just you. It's it's affecting yeah. everybody. Everybody well, right now is going through the same thing you're going through. They had lots of fun things planned, and everybody's mm-hmm. shit got canceled. <laughs> yeah, they just feel. Yeah, it always felt like there's momentum. You know, like and like you were talking about, you feel like you're having momentum heading in this year, 
and like it always feels like you got to keep that momentum going. You got to get the yep. know, calendar booked months out, and then it's like, man, you got to start from scratch and produce that momentum again from nothing. Yeah, and, it and feels oh, like it's so, gonna be so hard. Oh, and it's in an on and to boot with that, it's you don't know when to even you know like some places are starting to open up slowly, but. Mm-hmm. Still, they're limiting public gatherings. And now, you know, in our yep. industry, uh, you know, comics that we're doing theaters are probably going to be doing comedy clubs, which then knocks Sorry, everybody yeah. else out of the runnings for them spots. And mm-hmm. there's, you know, so many different factors going into it. It's like, well, geez, I don't even know when when is it time to start trying to fill my calendar, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. And as a promoter, I can't I can't call up a pal from L.A. and go, hey, come to Omaha. I can fill a couple shows for you. And, you know, because I can't guarantee that. Yep. And oh, absolutely. I, I can't risk them or me losing money at this, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it's not worth that gamble. Cause, like, oh, absolutely not. I, I don't know, like, what, like, regardless what I'm personally comfortable with, I think I may be more, a little bit more uh, trepidatious than a lot of people. Uh, but... I, I, but if, you know, if they're like, you can have comedy shows, I pro- you know, like, even if I said yes, right? Then that would mean the venue would have to be cool with it. And that would mean the audience would have to be cool with it. Mm-hmm. Like, and how do you say, let's pack this place when no one wants a packed place right now? Exactly. You know? Yep. There's so many factors involved with it and too many mm-hmm. variables. So it just makes yeah. everything so uncertain as to when you can even start again. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> scary times, but we yeah. got virtual comedy, I guess. <laughs> hey, better than nothing, right? It's fun. I, I've been yep. doing my podcast over uh, online too, and it's uh, it's nice because you can open it up to everyone in the country. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's this has been great because, and especially now that I have time too to do more of mm-hmm. these. Like, I have a bunch in the bank, but it's been it's been good because I've been able to get people that I probably wouldn't have gotten on my podcast because they would have been too busy touring and stuff. And sure. and when sure. they were off from touring, they're probably not going to want to come to a podcast, you know, because that's like their day off or whatever. So mm-hmm. so in that respect, it has been pretty pretty good. So yeah, yeah, um, but. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, getting to do one with you right now, that's like one of them opportunities where you're always on the road. And, you know, and then also being a comic myself, a lot of times it just things don't line up. Like you were here in the cities yeah. not too long ago, but I was yeah, gone. My tour you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And I was like, I didn't even bother approaching you about doing the podcast. I had thought about it, but I was like, well, no, nope, I'm not even in the area anyway. So that's too tight. Sure. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, yeah. So this definitely is good for that. Now opening it up to where I can do these with people wherever they are. Yeah, I'm stoked to stoked to be able to do it as well. Yeah, well, I'm I'm stoked to have you. So this has been great uh, catching up and talking about our our state of comedy now. But let's I mean it's already dark, but let's get darker. <laughs> Go into this the bombing part. Do you have a, a a story of a time where you felt like you bombed really bad? Yeah, uh, there's a there. The ones that stick with me the most come with me, like stick with me because they, they came at such a point in my life where I was already down, right? And a lot of the time, no matter what is going on in my life, I can always count on like performing comedy sort of bring me back up. Like, oh, I'm good at this. This is fun. I can do all that stuff. And, uh, you know, and that's always nice. But then those points where uh, you have a show and you're already down and then you do fucking so poorly – so you're just like, oh man, like not even this is bringing me back. Um, I did one at a, a casino in Dubuque, Iowa. And as we all know, casino gigs are like, I've heard a couple, I've heard whispers of good casino gigs and like fun casino gigs, but I've never encountered They're one. far and few between. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I, but I was, and here's the part: I was doing a competition casino gig, uh, which is, you know, still not great. And I, I was putting a lot of pressure with my on myself to do well. Okay, so with that being said, a couple of days earlier, <laughs> me and my now ex-wife split. Right? Oh so no! Like, yeah, I was just in the middle of a of a divorce, like freshly divorced, freshly getting ready to be divorced, you know, freshly on that trajectory of being divorced. And we, I, I do this, um, I'm doing this 
competition where I feel like, okay, here's my way to get into some clubs and get some recognition, stuff like that. And uh, the theater, huge theater, big theater. There's probably hundreds of people there, but they're all tables spread out. So not it's not a packed theater, it, but it's a huge theater, high ceilings, you know, not the best setup. And then, so I'm nervous. So I start drinking, right? And I, you know, and I just start drinking, like, you know, and I'm not feeling great. So I start drinking more. So I get too drunk to understand what I'm doing. You know, like I'm, I'm drunk. Like I live, like I probably have five or six gin and tonics and like I get up on stage and I just eat it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I don't hear anything. I can't see anything. And I'm just, you just feel like you're standing there and all the, all the air has been sucked out of the, uh, you know, of the, of the theater that you're in and in a big theater, it's not like, you know, six people there and I'm bombing in front of six people because everyone's afraid to laugh. It's like, there's people here and it sucks. And this is the worst I've ever felt. And so, you know, it's just bad. No laughs at all. It sucks. And then uh, I get off stage. <laughs> and then like my, I always, you know, like I always brought off a phone, texted my ex. was like, Hey, like, you know, I had a bad set you know, like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I pull up my, I pull up my phone. I'm like, Oh yeah, no one to text. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <put it back. laughs> and so it was just like that night was just like a real super low point. Uh, not only in comedy, but in life where it's just like, you know, like everything that I put my uh, time and effort to foster and to excel at has failed. <laughs> I have mm -hmm. nothing right now. And it was just a real bummer. Yeah, yeah. And uh I, I mean I had a very similar experience uh at a in in a small town Illinois where the, the my first show back after my mom died. Where I just go up there and I bomb my ass off and it's just like you know, this is supposed to be the good part of my life. <laughs> but <laughs> somehow it's not. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, good. I drove, you know, eight hours. To, uh, fuck, I forget. I forget what uh what a city it was. I remember it was Sarge's Tap, uh, and I I drove back to Chicago because I was living in Chicago at the time, and it was like an hour away from Chicago. And I, I did that show, and I just fucking ate it, and it was just the worst, just so bad. And I think they were. It's one of those ones where the crowd feels angry at you afterwards. Yeah, they're leaving. There's like the fuck is your problem man wasted our time like that like, oh yeah i do you feel like like you know traumatic experiences like that you know with the death in the family or you know somebody close or a divorce or whatever do you feel like mm -hmm. that's helped you get better as a performer going and and like going up and doing it and the reason i ask is because so i didn't start comedy until after like literally right after my divorce from my first mm -hmm. marriage that's what finally i was like all right i'm gonna go do this and i started doing comedy and then i was dating this other girl and we were supposed to be married and the whole whole shit went down or whatever and then after we broke up i was already doing comedy for a while but i felt like i improved like i went up and I did shitty right after because I was in a terrible place and I, I did some shitty jokes about the relationship and whatever. But mm -hmm. it seemed like every time something bad happened, I got better. Like I was leveling up. <laughs> yeah. <if you will. laughs> yeah. Well, it's just I, I think it all has to do with understanding yourself, you know, and understanding, mm -hmm. you know, what uh, how the world affects you and how to interpret the world. Uh, I, I don't think that <laughs> getting divorced made me better to stand up. But I think that having only comedy left after my divorce to completely focus on made me better at stand up for sure, or becoming a refuge for sort of my, uh, you know, for my excess emotions that I had at the time definitely made me better. Um, definitely gave me a place to go, <laughs> which is what I definitely <laughs> needed. <laughs> Oh but yeah, yeah that's, that's and, for sure. And those ex those experiences definitely have a, uh, you know, but it's sort of, like whenever I get nervous, whenever I, like I don't want to go on stage when I'm at a show or something, I'm always like, this is the job you do the job. If you know any other job you don't want to go in, you go in anyway. And I mean, I think that that has made me improve. Sort of going on stage no matter what, you mm -hmm. know, like 
no matter how I feel, uh, if, uh, you know, if I'm upset, unhappy, whatever, the show's not going to be fun. Or if, you know, you've, you've been to those shows where it's like, ah, this show is not going to go well. Like no one's doing well. Yeah. And, and so like, well, I got to get on stage and it's like you do. And then, and when you, when you go through these moments, I think this is true for all bombing. Uh, when you go through those, it's like, oh, it wasn't so bad. You know, like I could do that again. There's no real stakes here. They're like failure is just a failure and it feels terrible at the time, but I'll yeah, go home. What are you going to do? Yep. Yeah. This, tomorrow's a new day. Yep. Yeah. 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 I totally, totally get that. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. For me, like I said, it's just, it's like a weird thing. Cause I'm also very, and somebody else had pointed this out and I, I'm trying to get better at it. I feel like I have, but like separating my day from my performance, you know, like if I'm having, if I'm having a bad day and I'm in a bad mood, you know, mm-hmm. there was times when I would go on stage and I didn't perform well. My, it, my mood kind of showed up, showed up in my set, you know, like if I was yeah. having a bad day, then my, my comedy set wasn't so great because my mood was showing, you know, I was grumpy mm-hmm. or, or whatever. Instead of going up and thinking about, Oh, I got to do this as a job. I got to have a good time. This is what should put me in a good mood. Let's go have fun. I go up thinking, oh, man, you're all grumpy or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you're supposed to, like, shepherd everyone into a good time. It's like, come with me. We're having fun. But when things are going bad, you're just like, ah, I guess. Come on. Get yep, you know? just get out of here. Uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's not as attractive to crowds to do. Yeah. 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 That's something I've definitely been trying to work on improving, trying to separate that, you know, and it's, it's a lot easier to do when you're aware of it. And sometimes that takes somebody else pointing it out. And that's what it was. Uh, totally, Nathan Holtz totally. is the one that pointed that out. He, you know, oh, he was sure. like, you yeah, know, I noticed you, you know, when you have a bad set, it's cause you were kind of in a bad mood before or whatever. And I started thinking about, you know, times when I didn't do very well, I was like, damn, he's right. <laughs> I'm, that is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. gotta watch that. Um, just looking at some notes here, uh, which that is a good, uh, good lead into the, the this other question about the bumming of bombing. You know that dreadful uh-huh. feeling because you're talking about you know going through and everybody you know you bomb and. You just, you just what you do, but for the bumming of bombing, that dreadful feeling afterwards, how long does that typically last for you now versus when you first Ooh. started? Because I'm sure it's changed over the years. Yeah. When I first started, it was just like I had to wash it off with another set, you know, where it's like, but then when I first started, maybe it wasn't a set for another three or four days. So, you know, like it stick with me the whole time. It's like I had to prove myself. I had to show myself that I'm, I was capable uh, of having a good set. You know, it, it was, I wasn't incapable and this, this failure, you know, I had to wash it off me with a good set. And sometimes, you know, and now it's just like, I might beat myself up for maybe like a half an hour or like, all I have to do is, is verbalize it to someone else. If I really want to get over it, I go, go, man, fuck, I, that sucked. Like, you know, a lot of, like, I don't bomb as hard as I used to, <laughs> thank God, you know, where like, it's just nothing, where it's just zero. Oh, yeah, time. absolutely. Mm, and like I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty rough on myself in terms of what I consider a good set. Because sometimes I'll be those ones where like all, all my jokes were hitting, but one or two didn't. I'll be like, had that flat point, and I fucking hated it, you know. And I, I got really upset. We're very much the same. Like I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's it funny. Be- I'll be walking off stage cussing myself yeah. out because I missed one joke, and the audience doesn't know that I missed that one joke. They thought it was a great set, but in my head, I'm like, you stupid son of a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. And it's like, well, how was your set? And then they, oh, you, you did a great set. And it's like, well, that joke didn't hit. And it's like, yeah, that's one <laughs> yeah. fucking joke. It's like, well, I like that joke. <laughs> you know, like whatever reason, I'm focused on that yep. joke. Yep. It's sort of like, you know, there's the there's the old axiom of of the uh, comic like seeing the whole place laugh, and then the person in the front row is just has a sour look on their face, and they focus on that person. It's, yep. it's the same sort of thing, because I'm I'm focusing on the one or two jokes that didn't hit. Uh, but when I when I have a bad joke, when I like have, I mean, a bad set, like a real bad set, um, it depends. Like, if I can find something to blame it on, I will, um, but it still sticks with me. Like, if it's, a, if it's not my crowd, right? Like, Sometimes they're just not my crowd. Like I don't do great with uh, older folk a lot of the time. 
not all the time. Like I can get some older, older some older folk would be great. You know, they, they love me, but uh, older rooms um, can sometimes, I don't know. They just don't like me. They don't they think I'm too weird. Maybe they don't get my references. I don't know. I can't speak for them, but it's just sometimes like, well, I didn't get it, you know, like, and it's not, uh, that's not my crowd. It's okay. And uh, I don't beat myself up about it too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's more of like this existential on we where it's like will i ever have a crowd is there a crowd for me <laughs> yeah, uh, it, yeah. Uh, if they're not it like i'm supposed to make everyone laugh if uh you know if i can't make them laugh and who can i make laugh and am i am i fooling myself uh and thinking that uh like you know there are certain people that are for me and certain people are not or maybe i'm just bad at this you know so it becomes yeah. this different kind of spiral it's like i'm bad at this it's like are you bad at this could be <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's just, yeah. I guess I guess it's just a very long way to feel the same way. Yeah, but, but no, but that's man. true. I can see that because I I can relate to that as far as the just not being it everybody's audience especially with older people i don't feel like i do very well with older people and i don't feel i do very well with like younger people either like you know and i'm like do i have a crowd is my crowd just my age group and that's not mm -hmm. good because you know it's all the same stuff it's like well you got to make everybody laugh you gotta yeah. you gotta be everybody's comedian and it doesn't you know so what are you doing wrong and i actually think about that a lot like trying to figure mm -hmm. stuff out you know it's <laughs> It's tough. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I feel like that's the that's the beta by existence because I'm. I feel like I'm too, you know, alty, and I don't know, you know, what whatever the fuck that means. Alty, just like weird, <laughs> strange. Like I do, I do what I like to do, and sometimes if jives with other people or not, but for like basic clubs, like I'll, you know, I work at like Funny Bones, and I'll work at, uh, you know, more. Uh, you know, b bigger clubs, chain clubs, uh, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And, uh, you know, like I'll do good sometimes. So other times I'll do okay. And, you know, I'm like, oh man, th those aren't my crowd. Like, I feel like I'm a little too left of center to that. But then I'm not like those, the weird art people that are like, ah, here's my, you know, like yeah, my closer is my eyes squirting blood. Like I'm not, <laughs> like I'm not that. <laughs> like I, like I'm, I'm still trouble. doing jokes. <laughs> yeah, I'm just telling. Yeah, set up punch. That's all I'm doing. So like I'm in the I'm in the middle there, and it's difficult to sort of find my home exactly where I'm supposed to exist. And I think in a maybe it's reasonable or unreasonable thinking. That's why I you know like I have a hard time marketing myself. Like mm -hmm. how do I describe my bullshit to other people? <laughs> you know like. Uh, and, and that's, that's difficult because I, I was, you know, there's people that I, I've spoken to in terms of like, uh, representation, blah, 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 like industry folks. It's like, well, we got to be able to describe you in a couple sentences, you know, we got to package you like, like that. And it's, it's, I don't know how the fuck I do that for me. Oh yeah. You know? I, well, I feel that way too. And I, you know, I, it's like, anytime somebody asks me, what's your comedy like? I'm just like, or what's your style? I'm like, I don't fucking know. What, tell yeah. jokes. Sometimes yeah. people laugh. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that even but, mean? Yeah, What's yeah, your I comedy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have fun. I enjoy it. Some people yeah. do, but I don't know what. What's that factor? What's the one thing that like the 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 thread through all those people that connect them that make them similar? Like I, I don't know. Like I mean, like I, I, like I've there, there's been older folks that have loved what I've done. There's also you know, mm -hmm. but uh, but like when I go to those older rooms, when I go into those rooms, like you know, vacationers, like there's a room in Michigan that I've done probably six times, and I'm not going to name it, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, but it's I've I've done it like six times, and there's been four or five different kind of audiences, you know. And when it's old, I fucking bomb my ass off. But when it's younger, like, then it's a fucking great time. And I can never, like, I'm like, it's not the room. It's just like, it's, it, it, it changes all the time and I can't keep up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. It's, it all about, all about the people. I mean, at the end of the day, and it's hard to accept as a, as a, as a comic that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're just not everybody's cup of tea. 
You know, some yeah. people are going to like us. Some people are not going to like our style of comedy because it's comedy so subjective. You know, mm-hmm. like that's it's and it's all in what whoever's in the audience likes or doesn't like. You yeah, know, and, and what all what up am I to them. To do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, am I supposed to write different jokes for people that I don't agree with or what's funny? It's like I wouldn't be able to do that. I hate myself. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because then you then you feel like you're selling yourself out. Which yeah, totally. I mean, there's a fine line between you know kind of adjusting your comedy to to kind of to a feel of a room. You know, like reading the audience before you go on versus just doing all the jokes. You know, changing your complete style just to yeah. to appease what you know you think the crowd wants or whatever. Because yeah, because you then you definitely you definitely lose your artist integrity. And at the end of the day, then what's the point mm-hmm. of doing this, right? If you're not doing totally. it for a paycheck. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not doing it for a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, sometimes I am. There's been no shows. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, if, but if I had my perfect show, it'd probably be a comic book store where everyone's stoned. Those are always my favorite shows. Everyone's just like fucking partying and everyone's having a good time. A little bit, a little bit younger, maybe late twenties, early thirties. Those are my those are my folks. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. I love uh, the comic book stuff. Like that's mm-hmm. well, my favorite. My favorite shows have always been at uh, comic book related conventions. You know, like oh, sure. uh, doing stuff at con- cons and stuff. Always mm-hmm. a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, crowds are just all always so so uh appreciative of what you do and Mm -hmm. and so supportive of the comedy and stuff like i don't think i've ever had a bad show at a convention (laughs) yeah you know and i've did different you know kinds from your regular comic book stuff to like anime conventions and whatever every time always a good time (laughs) all right all right well if they they hit me up i'll go (laughs) oh absolutely uh well i don't know when they'll when right uh, because everything's up in the air now but the one in yeah. sioux falls is, is pretty good you know super con right. they usually do comedy i've been working with them doing comedy there oh, every yeah. year that they've been doing it so to well, try to yeah, get you it, in there sometime well i like how we're, we're talking comedy but also we're talking comedy in abstract sense now because we have no <laughs> idea if it still exists yeah, I know. Well, yeah. Well, well, no, I don't mean comedy at all. I just mean the event is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but yeah, but all the But you're right. Now, Everything, like... yes. Yeah, like, well, yeah, if it's still... <laughs> <laughs> Everything is very up in the air about everything, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is very, very scary. But unfortunately, <laughs> it's the reality we're in. Uh, but yeah, but like I said, they're good. They've been a great convention, and the comedy shows there have always been really good. So, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I would, yeah. If you're, if you love doing comedy at like comic book stores and stuff, you should definitely look into oh, yeah. doing stuff at conventions because, yeah, they're a good time. Even ones that don't have comedy, you know, I've hit up mm. and it's been fun to do. You know, they they'll let me do comedy there or whatever, and they've been good shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, always like like a uh, wet cash in uh, Chicago. Like that's one of my favorite rooms in the world. Um, no, so yeah. I mean, the shows like that, there used to be tons more, but mm-hmm. those kind of shows, yeah. everyone's just there and yeah, having fun. Yeah. I actually, uh, my, one of my dreams and it, it probably it's unrealistic, but honestly, one of my dreams is to, was, it was to open, um, like something like meltdown where it's a comic book mm-hmm. shop and it has a showroom and, you know, to do all that stuff. Cause it like combines everything I love into one thing. And, you know, cause oh. I used to own a comic book store. So mm. if I would have been in a comedy, then I would have already, already tried that. <laughs> <dream>. <laughs> oh man. Melt, meltdown was a great room. Like not melt. I mean, yeah, the yeah, not, not the show, either. but the actual theater. Like mm-hmm. the uh, like, because we had arguments and grievances there for about six months, and that was just so much fun. So, no, no. Yeah, unfortunately, I never got to perform there or go there. It uh, it closed before I was able to go up there, but. I've always wanted to do something like that because, yeah, yeah, I'm I myself, I'm a big comic book guy, so I love doing stuff at comic book shops and conventions mm. and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, when you do have a bad set, like, what do you do to try to analyze and what do you try to 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 get some takeaways to to do better the next time? Well, it's you know, it's I always uh, think about it like game tape, uh, like 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 you watch, um, you know, like a 
football practice or football where it's like, oh, the reason we fucked up, the reason we lost was for this. Like this, mm -hmm. this was where we got beat. So like I, I think about it in a way, uh, it depends if it is an open mic, if I am working on something, then I have my, uh, my notes because I outline every joke before I do it in like every beat. And then I'm like, and then I'll, I'll you know, write a little note like, you know, rework this or this isn't clear or, you know, different punchline or something like, you know, change this. Like, you know, hopefully I understand exactly why the joke didn't work or at least mm -hmm. find its weak, its weak points. And then I can work on it and make it stronger. Uh, but it was just like a, a set and the set didn't go well, you know, and, and if I'm starting off with something that I know works, like something I've done for years, it's like, you know, like that's my, that's my opener and it works. It works 90% of the time. Um, I'm probably not going to change anything. I'll try to like, I'll try to find out. It was there a reason why it changed, why it didn't go off as well. Did I come off too hot? Did I come off too like, was I too laid back? Uh, was I, you know, did I, did I give them ample time to sort of suss me out and like start to like me? Was I likable? Was I, sometimes I can be more too loud. I can talk too fast. I can uh, do these things. So um, were those were those the reasons, you know, find the problem. I have to find the problem mm -hmm. and then hopefully I can. If I can't, I go, well, fuck that sucked. And I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Well, I definitely feel like there are some jokes where if it doesn't, you know, you have a proven joke, you do it all the time. You always get a good laugh and a, you know, an applause break or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that one time it doesn't work. I'm like, well, that's a fluke because every yep. other time it works. So there's, you know, even if you find out what what might have caused at that time, it might not make a difference in the future either. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I like uh, it's it's always <laughs> like with the opener, you can always see what kind of set it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I like halfway through, you just go, "Oh, they're with me," or "Okay, I want to have like I'm really going to have to work." You know, and sometimes you can get with them, like you you can bring them on board, and then it's a little bit more work. Uh, so, you know, I, you shouldn't give up if your opener is not working, but, you know, but the opener is like, is a good canary in the coal mine. If they're right there, right away, you're like, this is going to be a good time. And if they're not, it's like, all right, time to put in some work and actually like, you know. And when you, know, you do that, when you have a situation like that, what does that mm -hmm. mean to you put into, put into work? Like some people you'll tell a joke and that kind of gives them a gauge of how the audience is where, you know, like, Oh, this is probably a conservative crowd. So I shouldn't do this material. I should maybe do this other material or it kind of changes yeah. the focus on what kind of material they do. What, how do you take that? Like when you feel like, okay, I'm going to have to work with this crowd. Yeah. Uh, a lot of time what I'll do is um, I'll start like going off script, you know, like just start talking to them and seeing if that raises their, uh, how, how engaged they are, their engagement. Or uh, sometimes I'll be a little bit more uh, animated. You know, I'll, I'll try to like, you know, get their attention in some way. Maybe I'll start going slower. Maybe I'll change my pacing. Uh, but I got to find something that works. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and sometimes something I've started doing, I'm starting to have uh, a not so stellar set and it has been working is I just, I'm okay with having a bad set and I decide to have as much fun as possible, even, you know, and just like try new things because mm -hmm. sometimes they can stick. And then, but also when the pressure is off, when the pressure is off me, and I just sort of start having fun, then the crowd will start, you know, sort of seeing that. And there, there's been times where the crowd who has not been having a good time, uh, they'll come around because, like, they'll even say something like, what the fuck are you doing? It's like, I don't know. Like, I love <laughs> you having a good time. Let's have a good time. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I mean, like, why are we not having a good time? <laughs> I mean that that's happened once or twice, but like when when it is like obviously going to be hard, I you have to engage in some way. Maybe mm -hmm. like sometimes I'll try uh, crowd work. You know, like you know a lot of people have bits, or, or at least there's parts uh, parts of my bits where I can engage people. Like, have y'all ever went to uh, a, a, a national park? You know, and they're mm -hmm. like, oh, which one? Like, did you like it? And then, like, you know, if if they say 
anything, you know, disagree with them, push, make fun, whatever, whatever is going to make, you know, engagement happen. So it's just finding a way to engage people one way or another. If it mm-hmm. doesn't work, you're at the same place where you started, you know? Yep. Oh, like absolutely. The, and a lot of the time, a lot of the time that does, that does sort of work. And I don't like doing crowd work. If I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I, I don't, I didn't write the crowd work. I enjoy writing. I enjoy watching the writing work and where the writing goes, but crowd work is not really my cup of tea. Um, although I have had some really good times doing it, it's not my favorite thing in the world. Uh, I'm right there with you on that. Mm-hmm. I'm not, and I don't feel like I'm good at crowd work anyway. Like I always, I always feel like when I try to do crowd work, I just make things even more awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I've already dug I, a I, hole and I'm just like, yeah. oh, let's see how deeper we can go. <laughs> I've definitely failed. I've definitely been like, all right, well, and then, you know, and then the next thing you do is you comment about how that didn't work the way you wanted it to. That didn't work yep. the way I wanted it to. And then sometimes that gets a laugh and it's like, just fucking anything. Just, you know, just, you're just, I'm just swinging it like in every pitch that's coming. And if I, and it feels like if you hit the right one and then they're on your side, then you get them rolling. Because once you get them rolling, then things can be really easy. You need to yeah. win them over and need yep. to, like, you know, get, like we talk about momentum, just the momentum that keeps rolling. And mm-hmm. then sometimes, like, that'll be a whole, it'll almost feel like a bomb where, you know, 99% of your jokes work, but they stop They stop laughing, like, ha ha. It's like, it's, there's more, right? And, you know, and then they're not on board for the next joke and you want to get them rolling. It's like, it was good. It just felt like a car that you couldn't turn over. You know, where they're like, they're laughing, they're engaged and they like it, but it's not one of those rolling laughters where you're, it's going to keep them going the whole time. And you feel like you have them in the palm of your hand. It feels like you're pulling them uphill and you can't, you can't get them completely. Those are sometimes just as frustrating, even though it's a good set. And, you know, by all indications, you know, you, you know, you killed or whatever, like it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like you were in control, which I think is the good set. The good set is where, you know, where you feel like you could do anything and it'll, Mm -hmm. it'll get a laugh. You can fuck jokes up, you know, like where, where you're in the driver's seat and sometimes, you know, you just can't get that when when it's close, when you feel like it's close or there, that's just so frustrating when you can't get it. No, oh, absolutely. I like what you said too about trying to, you know, adjusting the energy level at the mm-hmm. beginning, you know, doing that first joke and kind of trying to figure out if it was your energy and adjusting the energy, not necessarily your material, just your, you know, your presence and cadence and things like that. Cause those are, it's amazing. All those little things really can affect the set that, you know, yeah. there's a lot of technical things that, comics don't realize go into like it's not just your your timing and your jokes there's other you know other things i was one when i started people some of the best advice i ever got as a comic was to slow down (laughs) because i would go 100 miles an hour like i would get up on stage and it didn't matter if i was having a good set or a bad set i was just like i got to get through my material and blow just spit out all the jokes and people are like you got stuff but nobody can laugh because you won't stop it's like yeah. you gotta stop and let them laugh and then you know you're 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 basically stepping on your other punch lines because mm-hmm. you'll say a joke and they'll laugh and then the crowd's still laughing and then they don't hear the setup for the next joke because they're still laughing and yeah. then when you do the punch line they don't get it because they're behind and you know things like that yeah and and you have to give them permission to laugh you know, oh, absolutely. If, if you are in control of, of of the set, then you gotta be like, this is where you laugh now. And there has to be like a cadence. Sometimes, you know, there has to be like a cadence. There has to be an indication where that's the joke. And and because I mean, some people just like they're they're rhythmically in tuned with you, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and they're and they they're listening, but they're not listening completely because I think half the laughs are rhythmically in tune where like you stop ha 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 ha. And then like, you know, some, you know, you know, that you've gotten the applause break where it's like, ha 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 ha. Oh. And then they like, think about it even more. And then yep. it's that, it's that it, it's, it's the, the secondary sort of understanding that the joke was very good. And then within their whole body, they go, now that was good. And then they start clapping. And that's why applause breaks are so great because it's, 
like sometimes laughter is involuntary, but a, but laughter and like clapping, that's involuntary and voluntary upon inspection, you know? So, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, it's it's almost like, you know, uh, they, they, they're they reappreciating it in a different way. Mm-hmm. No, that's really good. That's very true. Um, we're going to start wrapping up, so I'm going to get into some of the other stuff. Uh, we'll touch a little bit. What's your writing process like? I know you talked about outline, outlining. Do you sit down mm-hmm. and write? Like, yeah. Do you have – yeah? Yeah, I, I sit down and um, – I, I probably write about four or five uh, of the joke before I perform it. And then, and they go through different writing things where I handwrite it, type it, uh, outline it. And then I rewrite it and I rewrite it and I rewrite it. And then I'll, and then when I go on stage, I have, I have notebooks specifically for like, uh, going on stage and my set list. And when I go on stage for an open mic, uh, I will outline every single beat and then I'll put pluses or minuses by the ones that work and they don't work. And then, you know, that I'll, I'll find out where the strong and the weak parts of the joke. So I'll keep the strong, either rework or lose the weak, and then just only have the strong. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. because I I always I go by the uh, philosophy that more uh, less is more, where yep. like the joke should be as short as possible. There's no reason to have any of the you know any of the extra stuff. I think about what information is needed for the joke to work, what exactly is I'm trying to say, and how can I say it as quickly as possible. That word economy is so uh, important to me because I want my jokes to be bam, 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 bam. Because uh, I think the rest is just filler, and uh, le- at least for me, that's not what I want. You know, and yeah. I think. Um, other people can do it their way and that's great. You know, it's wonderful. There's a lot of like storytelling comedians that like to, you know, build tension and uh, create scenes and stuff. And that's not me, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's definitely even comics that, uh, that do storytelling can, you know, less, it, I, I still feel like the less is more and there's definitely, you can use some, some word economy. Cause I, I'm, I'm more of a storytelling person. And when I start a joke, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, this is way too many words. Like I, it mm-hmm. always starts way too wordy and it's gotta mm-hmm. be like cut way down and, you know, but, to try to get to where I'm going. I always think about, uh, Kurt Vonnegut wrote this thing on writing about, uh, there's two reasons to write a sentence, uh, either to advance the story or reveal something about the character. And in terms of joke writing, it's like there's two reasons to, to uh, write a joke. I mean, write write a sentence, and that's to uh, reveal the information that's needed for the punchline or the punchline. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think so. I just think about each sentence and everything I'm saying. What purpose does it serve? Does it serve the punchline? And if it doesn't, then I probably don't need it, right? Mm-hmm. No, that's and so. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And that's and that's essentially what I have what I do with open mics in my writing process is eliminate everything that's not funny. <laughs> I will just like write for a lot, you know. And it's not up to me what's funny because you know, like if if it was up to me what's funny, then man, it would be comedy would be so easy, <laughs> like, right? <laughs> yeah, but I don't get to decide that. Unfortunately, none of us do. It's always some damn right. audiences, <laughs> yeah, people I wouldn't even hang out with. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna tell me about myself or so oh, oh boy you know but, <laughs> oh that's funny do you have any I, I this is kind of an odd question now being the how things are but do you have any short-term and long-term goals for comedy you know what i don't know <laughs> yeah uh, well, I, that's right now that's a fair, that's, that's a fair response yeah <laughs> Like everybody's goals are kind of like on hold. <laughs> yeah. I mean, move, moving to moving back to Nebraska because I lived in Los Angeles and uh, Chicago for about the past eight or nine years, and I moved back to Omaha about this last year and sort of like I'm going to figure out what I want to do because uh, I'm on the road all the time anyway, and uh, it's so much easier and cheaper to live in Omaha, mm-hmm. and I can just be on the road as much as I po- much as I possibly would want, and. Um, Right now, the road seems incredible, and I'd love to be there. Uh, but you know, like, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I want. I, I definitely want to make, keep continue to create stuff, uh, uh, whether it be you know writing 
scripts or you know sketch or whatever and i want to continue performing for sure it's just a matter of do i want to you know continue to put all my effort into it and right now i feel like i do Mm -hmm. but moving to omaha it's like okay this is where i'm going to figure out exactly what i want to do for the long term yeah and i have no idea because i took yeah I, I took the winter off and I was like, I want to see how it feels to be home for a little bit. And then <laughs> by the end of the winter, I was like, I need to get on the road. And I got on the road and then, and then it's just like, come home and it's like, well, you're not going anywhere. I was like, okay, well, so I don't know. Um, I, I feel like there has to be a sense of normalcy. There has to be a future that we can all agree on. It's going to happen before I can really understand that. Uh, and I'm not one f- for really making future plans. I think, you know, you got to live in the moment and appreciate the moment as much as possible. And yeah, that's, I totally agree with that. Especially I, I right now. Well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I think too, d- d- I, you moved back to Omaha. How do you feel about that? I feel like, cause I, the reason I ask is I lived in California for a while, you know, yeah. and working the road was something I wanted to do more of. And to me, it made more sense to live in the Midwest. That's why I moved back. I was yeah. like, well, you know, because I a lot of when I decided to move, a lot of my friends were, "Why don't you go to L.A.?" And I was like, "Well, I want to work the road, and it just seems, you know, it's more economically makes more economic sense to move to the Midwest." And that's why I did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the the coasts are great when you want to, you know, when you want to hit the big time, the quote unquote big time. But if you mm-hmm. want to do the, but if you want to just work, you know, then the Midwest is the place to be, in my opinion. Um, now I don't know, and there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make to live in the in, in, on the coast, and I don't know if I want to. Uh, and <laughs> and I, I I think it's a value judgment in terms of what's important to you, and what's important to doing comedy. Is it actually doing it, or is it doing it in a certain way? And I I think I'm still figuring that out exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if I, if, if comedy, if stand-up comedy is the most important thing to me in the world, as it was at one point in my life, then I wouldn't be living in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I would be, I would be elsewhere. Uh, so, I mean, because I put, I put all my, all my chips in the comedy for years and I, I would, I, I don't regret it. I would do it again. I loved it. And sometimes I want to do that still, but, uh, I think that there is more that I would like to focus on for the time being. And that doesn't mean the comedy will ever go away or I'll stop doing it in their respects. And hopefully I, I can do it at a high level. Uh, but, you know, like I think that my current situation gives me more of an opportunity to explore those other avenues. And that, and that isn't uh, outside of comedy. I mean, there's other skills and abilities that I can do from here and, and, and things that I can work on from here uh, with a lot more freedom uh, in, in a lot of different ways uh oh, a lot of ways in terms of like you know like time money resources mm-hmm. uh, you know the ability to film places without paying an arm and a leg that kind of stuff no, yeah right <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. that's the nice thing about living there's not a lot of uh not a lot of uh licenses and fees and things like that required to film at places it's more of mm-hmm. a just getting getting permission from a business owner or, or whatever, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, here you can, you can create, you can work, you can do all those things you want to do. The only problem with that of doing it in the Midwest instead of the coast is that no one really notices. And yeah. I mean, like we, we could, we could sit here and talk about and argue if the internet has changed that, but it really hasn't. Um, and and it, to a degree, but, it, it, but if you really want, to you know go up the ladder you have to be on the coast and i don't know if i want to do that and yeah i feel and, that i i feel that i i definitely feel that i think about that a lot like mm-hmm. trying to figure out what i want to do in terms of the future and stuff and it's like yeah i think i've kind of come to the the determinate determination uh can't even talk that anyway that if i was going to move to a coast i have to have a reason outside of comedy to bring me there. You know what I mean? Like if I sold a a script or I, a TV show or I got a job as a writer or something like that, something Mm -hmm. that, but to do it just for stand up comedy alone, I just don't, for me, I'm like, yeah, I want to do stand up comedy. That's why I'm here. I don't feel like, you know, I can do it fulfillingly on a coast. You can do it, but will it be fulfilling as doing it out in the Midwest? Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> you don't you don't get much you don't get much stage time in Los Angeles like anyone no. does, unless <laughs> unless you've already made it to that plateau. Yeah, where absolutely. You and yep. that's, that's, that's the problem. So, I mean, and that I'm, I love stand up. I miss stand up when I moved back to Chicago and, uh, yeah, cause I think Chicago is the best place in the world to do stand up comedy. Um, and so, yeah, I like, and things are fine here too. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I just wondered like, and being that you were on the coast and then coming back to the Midwest, cause mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there's, there are some comics that do that. They live out in, in on one of the coasts for a while, and then they realize, well, if I want to really work on my craft, it's it's yeah. better. But when you're out here, when you first start, you're like, if I want to get better, I got to move to the coast. You know, like that's the yeah. immediate thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I wanted to work a full time job and sit in traffic for three hours a day, then I would love <laughs> to live on the coast again. Uh, <laughs> love to live in LA again. Uh, you know, I, there's a lot of things I liked about LA, and there was a lot of uh, there's a lot of great people out there, and a lot of great shows and all that stuff. But uh, in terms of fulfill of fulfilling the needs that I have in terms of doing stand up comedy, it is not it. Yeah, I, I feel you there. I'm like I said, I'm I'm in the same boat as you on that. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. What's uh, what's one of your favorite venues to perform at? And do you favorite have favorite venues? <clears throat> um. Chicago shows. <laughs> yeah, like, you're I, like all I, of them. <laughs> oh, I mean, like when I think about like uh, the, some of the best shows in the country, in my opinion, uh, Chuck, which is Chicago underground comedy, one of my favorites. Uh, Queens, you should know that Timothy O'Toole is every Wednesday. That show is just just incredible. I love uh, Wet Cash, uh, which one of my one of my best my tour my tour pals uh, Jacob Lowry uh, helps run at Dark Horse Comics, Dark Tower Comics. It's dark and it's a comic, uh, <laughs> but there's but there's just a lot of great shows uh, there. And then any of the don't tells. Oh, I love the Velveeta Room in Austin. Um, don't tell is like blown up. I, I, mean, I run the one here in Omaha. Yeah, yep, I saw that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then uh, Casey Flesh runs the one up here in the Twin Cities. But it's mm-hmm. crazy that that went from just like a little show out on the in California to like a national brand. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what's amazing about it. <laughs> well, I mean, all the, the the dudes that run it, they can pack your show if you have a show and you and you have good comics, so people keep coming back. Oh no, absolutely, like, no, they're doing it right. Whatever yeah. they're doing, it's amazing. But it's just so mutually beneficial for everyone involved. So mm-hmm. it like, so it just blows up because the crowds have a good time, the comics have a good time, the promoters have a good time, and the people uh, out in California are having a great time setting them up and <laughs> making money. So yeah, right. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Do you have a, a a a gig like a favorite gig that you've done so far? Like, what's your oh like? Because um, I like to, I like to go out on a positive note. So yeah, bring yeah. It out. We talk about worst gig. Well, what's what's been your favorite gig so far? Oh, um, I mean. My favorite show, geez, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there's been, there's, I mean, there's so many, I, like, that I, that I have so many, like, uh, I mean, it has to be one of those Chicago shows where just like that, you have a great set in front of a packed house. And, or maybe uh, I debated Joe DeRosa at uh, Meltdown for Arguments and Grievances, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and that was like, I, and I had a great set and I almost won. <laughs> uh, uh, but, I have my theories about that. It's the other producers I worked with. They they wouldn't let me win. (laughs) They thought it was hilarious, but my record of doing it like 20 times, only had two wins in like three years. They're like, you know what? We're going to, whatever. I'm not bitter about it. (laughs) What I maintain maintain is not a loss, but rather a moral victory. Uh, (laughs) There's some. Um, there were some discrepancies in that law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, oh man, probably maybe one of the times at Fest out in Gainesville. Uh, oh, uh, Limestone. Any time in Limestone, I got to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that, that's going to be an interesting thing now. With you know, mm-hmm. there, there's been a lot of comedy festivals that have popped up in the last few years, and now, yeah. like that's. That's going to change tremendously on whether or not. Yeah. You know, that's, 
I mean, we already announced for Snow Jam. We're not doing Snow Jam next year. We're, you know, we we're going to take the year off because we're like, well, yeah. it doesn't mean, you know, a lot of comics aren't working, so they don't have money to go travel and do things like mm-hmm. festivals. And then on top of that, you when especially in our case, we're we're a charity, you know, so we're we're a community event. We need the community. Well, the community's mm-hmm. already hurting, so like, there's all these factors. So, yeah, yeah, I got I got accepted to a, a first year comedy festival. And they're like, well, we might have it. I'm like, all right, well, I might be there then. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Well, I, I, and I see some people, some of them are doing virtual comedy festivals. So we'll see yeah, what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Hopefully. I mean, I don't, I don't ever want to see anything comedy related go under, you know, like it's like one of them yeah. things like I want all the comedy to succeed, but <laughs> mm-hmm. Got mm-hmm. A, fingers crossed that they do, that they make it out of it. Yeah. Uh, the last thing, or a couple more things, uh, this kind of ties into like favorite gigs and stuff. Uh, and this can be personal or professional. What's something you're proud of and what's one of your proudest achievements? Uh, um, I'm just happy I can do comedy. You know, I'm just happy that I'm able to tour and I'm able to, uh, essentially make it mostly my job. Uh, I mean, that took a lot of work, took a lot of dedication. Um, I, I'm happy that, you know, I'm fairly well, uh, received (laughs) a lot of times. Um, I don't know, uh, the comedy expo that I ran in Chicago for three years, won a, you know, won a bunch of awards, local media there, uh, arguments and grievances, won a bunch of awards. We ran in Chicago for a while. Um, just, I don't know, uh, just doing comedy, man. Um, no, that's, that's, I don't, (laughs) I don't, I don't think I've reached, you know, I've reached the the mountaintop of what I've, you know, I've set for myself or, you know, I don't have this thing that says I did it, you know, like the, yeah. like I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't done the, uh, like, but, but I, but I am pretty pleased with, uh, with what, with what I have been able to accomplish, you know, although, you know, some might consider it meager, uh, it's still like, when I set off to do it and where, when I started, how little there was available to me and like, you know, like I'm really happy with it. And I'm, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to things that comedy has given me, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the ability to, to travel around the country and, you know, do cool shit with cool people and meet me and I just have good experiences. You know, I'm really happy with how, how that's turned out. Oh, that's that's beautiful. That's a good way to look at it. The final thing I like to leave on a, a more a, a silly note, if you will. Sure. And I have this thing called pick a number, and you're going to pick a number between one and twenty, and we're gonna, and then there will be a, a random question attached to that number. All right, let's do twelve. Twelve, it is. All right, your question is uh, the best piece of advice you've ever gotten. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Pertaining to comedy, can be any. It can be whatever you want it to pertain to. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's just do comedy because that's where my brain is at right now. Uh, very early on, my buddy uh, Nick Allen, who's a great comic here in Omaha, uh, said, "You want people to follow you into a dark room, you know." And I think about that when I get on stage, right? About how, uh, you know, no matter what you say or do you're going to want people to follow you, you know? So, so you need to be likable. You need to be liked and the the audience doesn't owe you anything. So just, you know, bring them with you and always have them come with you. And that's, that, and that's, I mean, that's sort of reframed in my thinking because I think a lot of, a lot of uh, comedy can be real selfish. Like I deserve these laughs for this, whatever. It's like, no, you got to bring them with you. And if you could do that, you can follow you into a dark room. Then, you know, you can do, you you know, then if, if people like what you're doing, then you can just do it. No, that's really good advice. That's a really good uh, perspective on that too. Mm-hmm. It really is because it really is. That's you know, you, like you said, there are a lot of comics that are like, "Well, you just need to laugh because it was supposed to be funny or whatever." But you're right. I mean, and that's how I, I kind of view you know, I view comedy. It's a journey, and you're the leader. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to build trust with your crowd so that they will follow follow you on the journey. They'll go that's with a, you from yeah. point to B. And if that's you, a huge part of it, yep, it really is. All right. Well, where can people find you? Um, well, I am at, uh, Mr. Zach Peterson on Twitter, King of the River Peterson on Instagram, uh, Zach Peterson comedy.com, all my tour dates or the, 
you can go look at my tour dates of what I was supposed to be doing these past <laughs> few months. Uh, I haven't done any of it, and I don't know when the hell I'm going to start again. Um, so uh, also anything like Broken Magic comedy on Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter, uh, and BrokenMagic.com. That's where like all all the projects I do, all the umbrella uh like the umbrella of the videos mm -hmm. um pro show productions podcasts and everything i do a podcast are you my brother. doing uh albums too yeah oh yeah i released no, david like heisen's uh debut record barn door open on broken magic records um debuted at number one on the charts oh, awesome yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm pretty proud of it. That's one of the accomplishments. I'm happy that yeah. I helped helped release a uh, uh, a comedy album of of someone. We went to number one, and then uh, I, I have a podcast called The Doom Room with my brother Francis. We talk about movies, and you know we're uh, long story bet between me and my, my brother Francis, but uh, we're we have a lot of fun, and it's really funny. And uh, you can find that on BrokenMagic.com, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me. I had a great time. The Art of Bombing is a Blitzed Entertainment production. Hosted and produced by Dan Bublitz Jr., the Art of Bombing intro music was written and performed by John Holt. All other music used in this podcast was under the Creative Commons license. If you would like to help The Art of Bombing, you can do so by subscribing, rating, and reviewing our show on whatever podcast application you use to listen to The Art of Bombing. For previous episodes, blogs, and more, visit artofbombingpod.com. Have a great week, and remember, stay safe so you can live to love. <laughs>